And as you can see, the axles are out, <clears throat> and all this crap has been torn apart. Um, so I'm working in here. Uh, I've got these new hubs, as I said, or flanges, and turns out they're not drilled for the set screw. So I'm working away here to drill and tap for a number six metric M6 uh, thread to, so it'll work properly. And then these, once um, once I've got these things prepped, I will, um, I guess I have to put the bolts in, yeah, I guess I, I'll put the um, um, studs in first, press those in, and then I'll take these down um, to a garage to um, get the new bearings and these assemblies pressed together since I don't have a, a bearing press. So that's what I'm working on. The other thing is, so there's the new axles over there, and they're nice. They're nice, nice, nice. Nice and firm, there's no wiggle, there's no movement at all, you know, no, no looseness at all in this CV joint. And I took the other ones off, which I've, <clears throat> I'm gonna chuck them out. These, these guys are brutal, they're, they're junk. Um, they, this is all loose. It's all wobbly and loose. Uh, both vertical play, it's got sort of a clunk in it, as well as t twisting the shaft. So, not sure, sure what happened there. Josh uh, provided them to me and said they were, you know, the good stuff. But, um, as I said, I somehow must have damaged them. Yeah, I was going to get the my local Porsche um, mechanic guy to put these axles in. But then, I just don't want anyone using an impact wrench on them. I want to torque them down nicely and carefully and not abuse them and make sure they're all to the exact right spec. So, not that I don't trust my mechanic, but I don't trust them. So, I want to do it myself, get it done perfectly. So, anyway, here we go. So, just a quickie here. Um, so, this is this, um, got a bearing surface on it. So when you're pulling the studs through, the bearing is is spinning, which is nice. Uh, you just use a regular wheel nut. Uh, in this case, it's conical and uh, sucks them in really easy, no problem. And uh, we'll only use that tool probably once. It's the uh, what is that? It's the uh, EC. Anyway, works great. Have no complaints. And I just clean up all my hardware, so give it a sort of a wash and solvent, and then I acid etched the stuff that looked a little rusty. These grade 10.9 bolts, they're super strong, but they have that shitty black black oxide finish, which you know rust can penetrate super easy. So I've just hit it with a, an acid etched black primer on it, just to, probably wasting my time, but making them look prettier and giving them a little, little chance against uh, corrosion. And uh, yeah, so there you go. So you can see I got the new axle going in here on the side and it, it was fine. I could do it with the shock in, but um, on the short side here, I think I'm gonna have to pull the shock out because what happened is I had to bend the angle on the uh, inner joint had to just because the the um, shock uh, where the strut drops so low the angle has to be really steep and because the thing is not torqued in it's very easy to uh, hyper extend this thing and then I got the um, the plate and the balls uh, twisted at a weird angle and they it jammed and uh, I couldn't unjam it without uh, and it all fucking torqued up pretty much so I have to um, get all greasy here and put it all back together and uh, try again but I'm gonna pull the shock out this time to uh, give me um, a bit more well, I'm gonna try doing it without pulling out the shock but um, or maybe not well, I'm gonna think about this what's what's more work but to be very careful at least about not hyper extending this thing and, and getting it to, getting those balls to um, to um, misalign with the carrier again. So 
so it may seem obvious, but I didn't realize that it would be basically impossible to do this reassembly of this inner CV joint without uh, degreasing it. I'm mean, not not degreasing, but just wiping all the grease off of it, getting everything clean, and then reassembling it after watching a couple of YouTube videos because the balls and the ca the cage inside. Um, they don't go in super easy. You got to push a little bit. You got to sort of they, they kind of snap in place. Um, not all of them. Some of them go in really easy. Some of them you actually have to force a little bit, which feels a little uncomfortable when you're doing it. But now that it's in, and I'll just show you. I got it's greasy as hell, so I don't want to get the camera dirty. But um, this joint is um, it's ready to roll again, and. Um, I am definitely going to take the shock out because I do not want to do what I did last time which is get it past its normal range of motion and then have one of the balls pop out and then start this whole process over again and uh, it's very frustrating doing this so anyway this is certainly not meant to be a how to rebuild CV joints video but uh, gotta be careful with the angle of these things when you put them in. Well I got the axles in and then the main uh, wheel nut torqued 273 foot pounds and then all of a sudden one of the wheels wouldn't turn the other one would turn freely but the second one wouldn't turn and it turned out that the when my Porsche mechanic guy pre pressed in the bearings into the um, spindle and hub um, the cert clip wasn't fully engaged all the way and it was sticking out and it was catching the edge of the new axle so when Took it all apart, fixed that problem, put it back together, and now uh, things are really good. And uh, they're nice and tight feeling, that's for sure. So anyway, that's a huge thrash over the last couple of days, but uh, got her done. I can go for a drive, maybe, uh, maybe tomorrow. So I'm changing the oil before I take the car for a spin. It's had 300 kilometers of pretty aggressive driving. It's had the oil changed once at about the 80 kilometer point. So um, yeah, kind of milky and still got some stuff in it, but um, not complaining too much. And then there's obviously the new stuff. So anyway, it's nice to have fresh fresh oil in there for the next, uh, I'll take that from 300k to about, I don't know, 800k and then I'll swap it over to the synthetic well, it's a nice sunny day, so I'm going to go for a drive. And I want my accelerometer in there, so I built this little stand that just lets me Velcro it on top of the ECU and then uh, adjust the, the level on it with the little bubble level on the top. So I'm going to plug it in and calibrate it one last time and then go for a drive. So, yep, I had only one of the two ignition coils plugged in. I had to disconnect it to get the accelerometer in. So, it actually started with half the cylinders, so that's hilarious. There you go, some raw fuel. All right. concerned about is the self-braking problem I had last time so I'm just going to drive around the block a few times and not get too far from home in case I have a call.
real damn good. There's, there's basically no movement in the brake pedal. As soon as I'm touching it, it's air active, so I've got it on the hairy edge of being too good. But, uh, as I said, for um, the whole point about uh, getting uh, some degree of heel and towing out of this thing, I needed to, to uh, reduce how far that pedal went. So it's definitely a little bit stiff, but we'll do some panic stops once the brakes are seated in. maybe being a bit noisier than the stock diff in terms of that on off throttle punk punk a little bit let me just have to look at that so I'm getting some jitter in my G uh, I'm getting about 0 0.02 uh, maybe a bit more uh, jitter So I've been driving around the GTI some more and I've been making lots of acceleration measurements and this is just sort of an example of spitting out some of the data from um, exporting it from the Holly uh, data logs into Excel so I can muck around with it a bit more. Uh, Holly has got lots of great um, output uh, graphs and things as well so this is one that Holly has which um, you know, it, it does a nice thing about showing auto scaling for whatever parameters you want to plot and then you can zoom around. So it's actually really, really good. But with Excel, I can I can just, you know, have a little bit more control over certain parameters. Plotting charts and graphs. So I've got, this is a coast down test to look at what my, um, the drag aerodynamic and uh, rolling resistance drag would be. This is some fl fuel flow numbers and uh, then actual acceleration numbers and uh, so this is um, the RPM and that's the vehicle speed and fuel flow and then acceleration and then I've just extrapolated the acceleration over here basically I'm getting my peak torque at 5750 just under 6000 um, there's two peaks there's one down at 3200 and then it dies off a bit and then it climbs up to almost 6000 and it holds pretty steady. Um, at the end of the day the power numbers uh, come out to around 240 uh, horsepower at the engine if you use a 20% uh, drivetrain loss. 
It's, uh, I've used anywhere between 20 and 22 percent for different vehicles over the years. Um, just to give you an example, uh, my Mustang, um, and it's on my website. So this is an old 87 Mustang with a 5, point, uh, you know, five liter engine, 302 cubic inch. And I had, you know, heads, cams, uh, exhaust, a bunch of different things intake. I got about 338 horsepower out of it. My peak acceleration in second gear was 0.43 G's at about 40, 45 miles an hour. And the GTI here has got a peak acceleration of 0.52 G's in second gear at about 60 miles an hour. So between 60 and 70 miles an hour, it's pulling with over a half a G. And, you know, I wonder whether or not this nitrous oxide is going to really be too much to handle. In first gear of this car, when you're driving it, it does uh, torque steer when you're full throttle. And it comes on the cam at 60 miles an hour, and it's like pulling super hard. And it wants to, you know, if you move that wheel a little bit, it's going to pull you left or pull you right. So um, it doesn't torque steer on its own, but it certainly is sensitive when you're accelerating to moving that steering wheel around. Um, just trying to imagine what it's going to be like, you know, if I add 100 horsepower worth of nitrous. And uh, whether it'll even hold the tires in second gear. Um, doesn't hold them in first gear. Anytime I go full throttle and I come onto the cams in first gear, it's spinning them. Probably it won't do that with the slicks, obviously, but uh, it certainly does it with street, uh, the uh, you know those street high performance uh, uh, Bridgestone Dorizas. Um So we'll see how this goes. But it's um, you know my fuel flow numbers, about 108 to 110 uh, pounds of fuel per hour uh, above uh, 6,000 RPM. Um, and continuing on up, it looks like this engine will continue to build power if I rev it higher, but because of the rod stroke ratio and the fact that it's a big stroker engine, the, 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 the rods go at pretty harsh angles, and revving the piss out of it uh, above 8,000 is if I get another 10 horsepower is not worth it. So this thing is pretty much flat on the horsepower, maybe climbing slightly from 7,500 on up now it looks like, but um, you know the engine's meeting or exceeding my um, power requirements, so it is what it is. Um, I'm not going to do the chassis dyno just because I've been reading about the different chassis dynos. They're all calibrated differently. They all come up with different net horsepower numbers, and people are often very frustrated doing that. So I've always banked on acceleration data as being, you know what the vehicle weighs, you know what the tire diameter is. You can very quickly calculate the torque at the wheels. So my car is producing an actual 200 horsepower at the wheels, and um, and then the 20% gets you to, to, to the 240. So, so there it is. Oh, by the way, the brakes are working nicely, and um, you know I'm going to uh, get some Sparkle racing seats. I've decided uh, to hold me in really securely because the car actually, you know, it throws you around a little bit inside the car. So, I'm going to get um, five-point harnesses put in with a temporary bolt-in. Um, sort of mini roll bar, it's just going to go between, it's going to mount uh, behind the seats into the stock um, seat belt, uh, upper and lower locations, and uh, just provide me the bars running up, or, up and below the seats to bolt the seats and fasten them and support them and all the rest of that in the seat belt. So, um, you know, that'll take a little while to figure out, but I'm going to go do that next. I should show you the data actually, so there it is, sorry for the uh, flickering, but it's basically um, just around 240 horsepower. Uh, torque peak is, um, as I said, it climbs a little bit above 8,000 maybe, but I'm not going there. And torque really comes on strong above 5,000, well, about, about 4,700 it really goes hard. So. Um, you know, it's going to be hard to launch this thing in first gear and get it up on the cam quickly. There'll be a bit of a pause as it sort of climbs up, so I'll have to drop the clutch at four grand or something and try not to spin the tires too much. But uh, there we go. And I said that's based on a 20% uh, drivetrain loss.